We continue with Edgar Rice Burroughs' famous story, Tarzan of the Apes. Greystoke throws himself flat on his face. The ape lunges past. Greystoke regains his feet. The ape is faster. Greystoke is running for the hut. The great ape from one powerful leap cuts him off. It's too late. Oh. Those horrible hairy hands are reaching for him. Oh. Greystoke turns. His face is a horrible mask of terror. He looks into those inflamed, raging eyes. Oh, that voice is a terrible cry. Oh. A cry dreadful to hear. He springs. The man crushes his fist into the hairy face. It serves only to infuriate the brute. The huge mouth of the... Ape open, his yellow fangs dream. Greystoke oh, struggles brutally to escape the mighty clutch. I am a hot headed dragon of the bull ape was on the man's face. Oh, 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 it was oh, the end, oh, the end. Oh, there was no chance now. Oh, a shot oh, from where? The great ape screams with pain. Slowly the great body sags until it drops on all fours, motionless. Greystoke watches the flame go out of the great beast's eyes. With a sighing grunt, the great man-beast of the forest topples over dead. Its jaws fall open. Its eyes grow cold, glazed. For a moment, Greystoke stands in frozen horror and wonderment. Then slowly realization dawns on him. His wife had shot the brute. He whirls and staggers to the cabin. Alice. Alice. It's all right, dear. You shot him. Oh, Alice. Where's the water? Where's the water? Oh, it was gone. There, darling, there. Everything is all right. It's all over, dear. I'm safe. And the brute is dead. Oh, the beast, the beast. Now, steady now. Everything is all right. He's dead, dear. Uh, don't get excited. Relax, Alice. You're a little hysterical, that's all. Just a little hysterical. While Greystoke is trying to soothe his wife, miles away from the little hut on the seashore, the death cry of Bolat came to the keen ears of the ape tribe. Some of the apes are grubbing at the roots of trees. Young are tumbling over each other in the clearing. Some are swinging indolently from branch to branch in search of fruit. The cry reaches their ears. All pause. All are silent for a moment. They recognize the death cry of one of their kind. As though one accord, they gather in the clearing. The females and young chatter excitedly. The males grumble. The hair on the back of their squat, powerful necks bristles. They hold a chaotic conference. One giant beast assumes command. He is Kerchak. Another male of huge proportion disputes him. In a few moments, one of the two bestial half-men will be the ruler. The other will be a torn and battered victim. Two contestants stand facing each other. The tribe makes a great circle. The greater of the apes emits a fearful cry which echoes through the jungle to silence all within hearing distance with its ferocity. It is a challenge. With a snarl of rage and hatred, the smaller one hurls himself upon his opponent, burying his fangs deep into the other's shoulder. With a cry of rage and maddening pain, the greater ape smashes the other in the face with his open hand. Without a pause, without mercy, he's upon him again, fighting for a hold. The smaller ape is more agile. He eludes for a moment, but only for a moment. He's upon him again. Again, the smaller ape side steps him out with a savage blow. The greater ape catches his arm, breaks it with a snap. Howling with pain, the smaller ape turns to stand the other brute's charge. He knows it will be his last. He's still on his feet, only by the intensity of his dogged animal will. Triumphant, snarling, horrible to see... The brute advances. The others attack a scudel against him. The fighting arms affect him not at all. With a roar, the great beast is upon him again. Gasping, he sinks to defeat. The victor picks up the battered form and hurls it to the earth again and again and again. Then, satisfied, he voices his cry of victory, telling the jungle that he is the ruler of the tribe. No one disputes his claim. The rest of the tribe resume their chattering. The new ruler is issuing his first command. He just grumbles. They all understand and take to the trees after him. As he starts off through the jungle on his way, from whence came the dying cry of Bolat. And in the little hut that Lord and Lady Greystoke built, we find that Alice has recovered from her fight. Oh, John, 
John, you're alive. But it's only good fortune that you are. That was a lucky shot. Well, that was a good shot. Whether from good luck or good marksmanship. Oh, how I hate the jungle. Oh, now, Alan. That probably won't happen again in a million years. But this is the first time one of those beggars has even really attacked us, you know. Yes, I know. But I'm so tired of being afraid. And I'm even more fearful since the baby came. No, oh, hush, dear. As long as we're in the hut, we're safe. It was foolish of me not to have taken my rifle when I went out. I'll be more careful after this. And there won't be a thing for you to worry about, dear. Not a thing. John, dear, will you please see what's the matter with you? <laughs> right, though. What is it, lad? Any complaints to make? Is he covered up? To the eyes. Oh, I see. He's sleeping on that wooden doll I made for him. And he finds it jolly uncomfortable, too. There. How's that? Fine. <laughs> now go to sleep and let me hear no more out of you. Oh, is that so? Well, tell me about it in the morning. <laughs> John, have you ever wondered what the baby will be like when he grows up? Very much like any other English boy, I imagine. Oh, no, he won't. Not living in the jungle all his life. <laughs> Nonsense, dear. He isn't going to live in the jungle all his life. Why, long before it's time for him to go to school, we'll be picked up. It's only a matter of time. Two years. And not even a sight of a ship. No. I'm afraid that your optimism is commencing to ring a little false. <laughs> Nonsense. You're just upset after what's happened tonight, that's all. But even if we were doomed to stay here forever, it isn't so bad, you know. We've plenty to eat and we're comfortable. Yes, I know. But it's always living in fear of the jungle. However, there's no use hopping on it, is there? No, of course not. Try to forget about it. Yes. Yes, I must. Would you mind closing the door? Mm, right oh. When Greystoke stepped to the door, the door he was never to close, he came face to face with a tribe of brutish, hairy figures. Oh. Alice! Alice! My rifle! Quick! In an agony of haste, John tried to close the door in the face of the great apes, but they thrust it open without effort and stood for a moment, blinking in the light. Alice! The rifle! Hurry! On the table! Don't come there! Throw it! No! Don't! Don't bring it! Throw it! I can catch it! Yes, yes. One great oak with troubles of the dead. Oh. The other, maddened with fright and rage, surged into the room, oh. overturning tables and chairs. The gun is wrenched from Greystoke's hand. An ape is peering into the crypt. A feeble cry is heard. Kayla, the great female ape who still clutches the body of her dead baby to her breast, lets out a cry. She drops her baby into the crib and snatches the human baby. Clutching little Lord Greystoke to her shaggy breast, she huddles with him in the corner, protecting him from the fury of the tribe as they demolish the contents of the hut. Hours later, the cabin was silent. The jungle had taken its toll. Kayla, the great she-ape, departing, bears alive and wailing the little son of Lord and Lady Greystoke into the jungle fastness, where a strange destiny awaits this boy, who will become the mighty Tarzan of the apes.